So I love starting out with this. It kind of breaks the ice a little bit for the audience. So what are you looking at here? Any takers? The ocean. The ocean, exactly. It's big, it's blue, it's vast, and it's almost peaceful. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. Well, if there's one sentence I could sum up my entire um, professional career with so far over the last five years studying seabird foraging ecology, it would be that the ocean is highly variable and very dynamic. And um, it, including the oligotrophic ocean, if we come to home here in Hawaii, um, it's the prey distributions within our oceans are very patchy and few and far between and highly variable. So bringing it back to seabirds, how do seabirds make a living in an environment that is uh, highly um, changing over uh, every day over time? So what we do know is that other seabirds have shown certain responses to climate variability. And so uh, large scale temperature changes have been shown to impact marine food structures. And then also predator distributions, not only seabird predators, but also upper trophic level predators such as tunas and dolphins, cetaceans. Um, so, uh, I'm going to walk you through some short-term and then a long-term example of how seabirds respond to said changes. So our short-term example is all the way in Australia. It's looking at brown knotties. So what we have here is this chart is showing um, breeding success on the right-hand side along uh, a yearly gradient, so 1991 to 2000, and then also the white boxes are the volume of beaked salmon available from fish fish landings. And so, um, what we notice is the the black diamonds that there was poor breeding before the 1997 El Nino event, and you can actually see that the breedings had complete and total failure in 1996 and 97. And what kind of led to this is that as the ocean started to warm, oops, the, the, beak, the preferred prey item, the beaked salmon dropped in availability. And then, so you can see the also drop in breeding success. Then as it stabilizes, breeding success kind of stabilized for a year and then it dropped as soon as this no longer became abundant over time. And then as our prey availability starts going up and then the ocean starts cooling and more productivity due to going into more normal conditions, our prey availability is going up and so is the breeding success. Um, so that's a short term effect of like an ENSO event, El Nino event. And then a long term, more decadal process. Uh, this study is about um, a decade long and they noticed uh, with elegant turns on Madrid Island, which is an island off of Mexico, they noticed in 2000 that they were breeding northward into Southern California. And so I'll quickly explain this little flow chart. So <laughs> we have a beautiful picture of elegant turn. And then, um, so the sea surface temperature around Madrid Island from the year before negatively impacts fishing effort from that same year, along with um, positively affecting sardine landing. So what this means, is that the change in sea surface temperature negatively affects fishing effort, meaning they have to fish more, and therefore they're taking a higher percentage of sardine landings that are available for that year. These variables, along with the sea surface temperature around Madrid for a current year, affect how many of the birds decide to go nest north. And it kind of makes sense. Why would you stick around in a place where you have to work harder for you and your chick um, when you can just move up north and everything that you want is available to you. So the migration is triggered mostly from sea surface temperature and reduction in sardine population. And so, yeah, like I said, this these birds are migrating over 600 kilometers north to be able to support themselves and their chicks during the breeding season, during uh, warm sea, sea surface temperature anomalies. So bringing it back to our focus, 
species for today. We're going to be talking all about red-footed boobies. They're of the family Solidae. They are the smallest of the six booby species, and yes, there are that many types of boobies. It's my only joke, I promise I'll make. Um, <laughs> they um, are the most pelagic as well due to their size, and they are pan-tropical, meaning they're found all throughout the tropical band, and they're colonial, which means that they breed and live at their colonies, which is a plus for this study. Their lifespan is about 20 plus years, but um, banding has been done, and so it's an ongoing lesson to see how, how long they're actually living. Uh, their weight is about two to two and a half pounds. Um, and sexually, they are different males, or females are larger than males. Um, so females are on like that two plus, two and a half plus pound range. And then egg laying, many papers talk about how they're asynchronous. And here in Hawaii, they are also asynchronous, but they mostly have a peak between February and May uh, for their chick, chick rearing. And then uh, for foraging guilds, they are aerial pursuit and plunge divers. So aerial pursuit is like this picture from Howl. And so they're chasing neuritic species, which are just species that fly out of the ocean, like a flying fish. Also flying squid, which we'll learn about in a few minutes. And then plunge diving. These guys can go 80 feet above the ocean surface and plunge straight into the water. They have really awesome air sacs in their body cavity that allow them to do that without messing things up. <laughs> so it's they're pretty remarkable foragers. And then um, it's about six meters max. Yeah. What is that dimorphism? Dimorph it's just the difference between... Uh, sexes, male, female. Yeah. Then the egg laying? Um, when they lay their eggs. Is it it's, it means that they do it all the time. But I'll answer questions more at the end okay. so that we can get through the talk. But thank you. Um, and then so just to show you guys, not many of you guys get a chance to see these. And so I included a small slideshow so that you guys can also appreciate uh, the beauty of these the species. And these are all pictures I've taken from the Marine Corps base here on Oahu where they uh, live. So, and this is actually one of our tagged birds from this year. <coughs> He's got a pretty female next to him. You can see the differences. Can see sure. This is what it looks like before they're going to regurge. <laughs> Fortunately, this guy didn't, but I was kind of hoping for it. <laughs> um, and then this is also part of a study we're working on right now, but <laughs> you can see how similar they are to the decoys. This is 25 who you just saw in the other picture actually sitting on an egg. But they are quite beautiful and remarkable. So, and you can actually see them on your own without having to go to the Marine Corps base. So a lot of these pictures are taken across the street from Manana um, and they come really close to the shoreline. And then sometimes juveniles are with them. This is actually taken on Easter and Midway. <coughs> and then there's a juvenile, about third year. And then a chick. Everybody loves the chicks. <laughs> and then this I put in, this is not one of my pictures, but about 10% of our population here on Oahu is the dark morph. So, and they're very beautiful as well. Dark morph. So they're all brown instead of the nice white with the black. So now that you know what they all look like and have enjoyed that little bit, <laughs> the main question for my thesis research was, can we use red-footed boobies as an indicator species? And they for certainly have key indicator characteristics, which I'll walk you through. One I've already mentioned is that they're non-migratory and they're colonial. So they don't go anywhere. They stick to their colonies all year round. They live and breed there which makes them very easy to study. You can visit them every year. Hopefully they stick around. And um, they also have localized foraging during the breeding season. So this is a figure from Adams et al. They're working on an overall uh, atlas of seabird foraging. And so they were able to tag also, this was important to show at the time, Boehm was doing a tracking study. And they wanted to see if these birds were flying through 
the projected uh, offshore wind farm areas. And so the answer was definitely yes. <laughs> but it's neat to see this picture because they all stick to their own islands. So here we have green Oahu, red Kilauea Point on Kauai, and then the gray is Lehua off of uh, Niho, or Niho. And so also we have been able to show that they have a strong association with subsurface predators, but they're generalists. They're not associated to any one sur subsurface predator. And these include yellowfin tuna, mahi-mahi, spotted dolphins, but the most uh, popular one is the skipjack tunas or aku, um, which is also an important fishery here around Hawaii. So why do, why study red-footed booby diet? Well, like I said, you know, all of the above, but they also respond to environmental change like we talked about before with those couple of examples. And so here is an example from a study by Harrison and Secchi back in the early 1980s, 1981 to 82. It, 1981 is a normal year leading up to an El Nino event, and then 82 is the precursor <coughs> year to the El Nino event. And so blue is 1981, red is 1982. And what we're looking at is the frequency of omastrophid squids or flying squids within the diet of red-footed boobies off of the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. And so we have winter, spring, summer, and fall along the bottom uh, x-axis, frequency along the, the y-axis. And so what we see is during 1981, we have this nice increase of squids and then it decreases into the fall. During the warm year, we have an increase in omastrophid squids, but then it stays constant. The amount of squids within the diet state remained high. And so what can we contribute this to? Well, if we look at the MEI or multivariate ENSO index, it's an index that includes six different uh, environmental variables, runs a test and kind of gives us what the environment or predictions also of what the environment's gonna look like. So we can see also in blue, uh, 1981, red 1982. We can see that there was a roughly normal year in 1981, and then 1982 just kind of skyrocketed. And what determines an ENSO event is three consecutive months, two month periods of anomalous conditions. So, what we can attribute to the remaining high amount of omastrophid squid within the diet is possibly the uh, anomaly of. Um, ocean conditions. So with this kind of gave me a good precursor to trying it on uh, Oahu because I had two study years, 2014, which was a normal year, and then 2015, which was also a precursor into an ENSO event. So looking at the study site, we have Ulupau Crater, which is kind of the tip here, and then all around uh, the colony is right where the red box is. Um, it's located on the Marine Corps base here on Oahu. It's estimated to be about 700 individuals with 200 nesters, but just from being there once a month for the past couple years, I can say that this is just kind of like a lower estimate. I feel like there's more, just we haven't had the chance to actually count, have a good uh, quality count. So this is a, a low estimate. And then I looked at 106 regurgitations that were collected from chicks or from adults provisioning chicks from June and July of 2014 and 2015. And I mainly just put these numbers down here to show not only the sample sizes, but also that I sorted through almost about 10 kilos worth of uh, red-footed booby regurgitation. <laughs> so uh, if you ever you know, run into any, you can feel free to send it my way. <laughs> um, Yes, so looking at the field work for this project, this is a picture of the colony up on the higher road. And so what we would do is we would go at night, the birds are more frequently coming back from a foraging trip at night. And so we'd set everything up, get ready, get our ladders ready, have our EOD, which is awesome. They escort us to make sure we're not gonna accidentally step on things we're not supposed to. And um, so then we kind of wait until it gets dark. Then we start looking for nests. So here we have Todd Russell. He's our master booby wrangler. I lied about the joke, but <laughs> 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 so he's uh, really great. He helped, he's one of the 
environmentalist on base and helped kind of set up this whole project along with uh, Lance Bookless. And then here's me collecting a diet sample. Uh, it looks nice and gooey in there. It's really warm too. <laughs> and then we have Eric Vanderwerf, uh, who's also a great booby wrangler, and uh, Josh Adams, who is part of USGS and helped fund the study along with BOEM. And then here is just the raw dates of when we actually did the deployment and recapture of I got you tags, which is what Josh is actually deploying onto one of the red-footed boobies. These help us collect the GPS tracks that you'll learn about later. And as you can see, there is about a two week difference between the years of sampling and this actually becomes important later in the results. And then here's just kind of a <laughs> Another group picture. Also, David Hirenbach, who is my advisor, sitting over there. And then Todd again, uh, me, and then uh, another helper, Robbie Coley, uh, before we got all pooped on and dirty and nice. Oh, sorry. And then, so looking at the ocean conditions for our two study years, we can see that uh, nice comparison between a normal year leading into the ENSO event along with the precursor year. Um, so that's just, and then the difference was very significant. Um, so we have, this is just to basically tell you guys that we tested to make sure the two years are different and they are. So we are testing two years of contrasting ocean conditions. And so for my first chapter of my thesis, I guess I should have mentioned that all of this is my thesis research that I presented last year. And so if it's really sciencey in some parts, I apologize, but um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys will appreciate it. So for my first chapter, our goals were to just examine the diet. There's only one other study back in the 60s that Philip and Myrtle Ashmole did, and it's actually uh, at the same colony. They used 12 regurgitations. So this is kind of a, a sequel to what they did, but on a bigger, grander scale. And then in, we wanted to investigate two sources of variability. So we're looking at interannual variability since I showed you that the two years were oceanographically different. And then we also are looking at uh, the difference between male and female. Do males and females eat different things? So, and then here's a really good example of what a, a diet looked like from one bird. And if you can't imagine them eating all that, their mouths open very widely. <laughs> Have quite big stomachs. So this is kind of a flow chart that I created showing how each chapter or part of the research went. So the red box is what we'll be looking at for the diet portion of my research. Um, it started out with sample sorting and then we'll go into the different, different uh, sections. So what we did, and I'll go through this very briefly, it's a lot of information all at once, but we determined prey classes, so fish, squid, oops, and other. That's pretty much all that's within the red-footed booby diet. There were some parasitic isopods, but not enough to be able to quantify anything from them. Then we determined prey freshness, which is just basically you look good or you're like super mushy and I can't tell what you are. And this is just a quick description of what that looks like. <laughs> and then there were a lot of hard parts too, like I'd find a lot of flying fish wings and things, but those are all classified under mush for hard parts. So, but that's a good visual of what I ran into. And then basically we ranked all of the really good looking things and that's what our analysis is based on. And I put this picture in there. It's a really unique find, the guy in the middle what does he look? He looks like a mola mola, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so this is a North Pacific slender mola mola, and it was actually found within one of the diet samples. Uh, and it's quite amazing. At first, its wings were kind of folded in, uh, and I had no idea what it was. And then once I figured it out, I was like, oh, and, you know, ran to the computer, figure it out. And I was like, wow, it's a mola. So they can eat anything. <laughs> it also goes to show that they're very generalist with what they eat. Pretty much what they find will be what they eat. So from 106 regurgitations and 81 birds, the total mass, which I have here on the bottom, which is also shown in this figure, uh, the percent, um, the bra total mass did not differ by year, which is nice. They pretty much eat the same amount um, over years. And then the, what we do see is in 2014 here, 
they ate mostly fish, 67.7% is a good chunk of the diet with uh, squid coming in second. And so there was no difference between 2015, the amount of, per fish or squid, but we do see that they mostly eat fish. That's pretty much the main takeaway from this. But this, the normal year for oceanographic conditions, it was significantly different that they did eat more fish. Uh, for the year that wasn't, or uh, for the year that uh, is warmer conditions, they seem to have broadened and not been so maybe picky about what they eat. So we'll, we'll dive into this later. So for the prey analysis, looking at genetics, I quickly want to run through this with you. So out of our total number of prey used, uh, we were able to use about 50% for the genetic portion that were good enough with the freshness. Um, and then out of the 47% that we tested, 82% of it was actually successful, which is a very high, awesome success rate <laughs> using genetics, especially since it was it's one of the first times used and the first time used in our lab. So it was really great. And we, what we used was a DNA, basic DNA extraction method. Um, if you guys have more questions about that, I can Why definitely answer. Uh, yes, there is a fishery in the Indian Ocean. I see that. Where do you, where do you find it? <laughs> uh, I will tell you about that oh. in a few <laughs> slides. <laughs> so um, out of... Uh, the amount of squids that were sequenced, so 235, 232, so 98% ended up being this one species, which was a pur purple back flying squid. And this is quite an amazing find that we'll talk about later. Here are some of the flying fishes that we would see, but you can tell different species based on their uh, different uh, caudal fins and pectoral fins. And then this is what one year's worth of sorting. <laughs> looks like those are all individually wrapped prey items. So just to kind of give an idea of what the genetics portion looks like, we take these prey items, a little tissue sample about the size of a pea, run through all of the steps of the DNA extraction, PCRs, get it ready for sequencing, and then this is kind of our gel machine before, and you can see all the little DNA strands that are colored, and meaning that it should work. <laughs> And then it goes into the sequencer. So then what we did find was that we got 32 overall species within the diet for both years. And so we ran a refraction analysis, which basically tells us if we sampled enough diets to be able to determine, like to be able to fully describe what the diet looked like. And the take home from this is that all of the estimators we tested basically asymptoted. And so, yes, we did. We were 32 species was enough to describe the red-footed booby diet. Um, and like our actual line is this gray one. So it, it worked pretty well, which is great because then we didn't have to do more sampling to justify our reasons. So for species diversity, it's not normally used for diet, but I used it to see if we could try and use it for diet studies. Um, what we found was that the red-footed booby diet is very diverse. Uh, and because there's one main fish or squid species, we ended up having three, but they only accounted for three individuals. Uh, the other two species only accounted for three other individuals. So with one squid species mainly controlling the squid side of things, the species diversity for the diet was controlled mostly by fish and the amount of fish species you ate. And the diet was more diverse in 2014, just meaning that there were more fish species present in 2014 than 2015. And here, looking at like the different groups that I created and number of species found per group, and then also the species diversity index number, we have females and males of 2014, and then the warm year 2015 with the females and males. And what we see is that males in 2014 ate more fish because the higher number of diversity means that you ate more fish. And then in 2015, we have a switch where the females actually ate more fish. So this is actually quite interesting. So, and we'll see uh, the justification for this also later. So looking at kind of abundance of prey species by mass, and then also looking at percent prey species index of relative importance. This is just an index that tells us how important certain species are within the diet, but only incorporating them if they were found within a certain sample. So this is a really nice index. If you want to know more about it, I can explain it after the talk. 
But looking at uh, percentages by mass of the total diet, uh, the purpleback flying squids had the highest percentage for both years, 2014 and 2015, and were also uh, very important within the diet. And then looking at two of the top species found um, for 2014, the top species of flying fish was the two-winged flying fish. And I have a picture on the next slide of what it looks like not digested. <laughs> but this is just the one that we took a sample from. And then in 2015, the top flying fish species was the glider flying fish, which I do not, I could not find a specific picture for, sorry. But this is what the one I had was. Um, and even though these two spe uh, species had a high... Uh, percentage by mass within the diet, the squids still overruled um, on the species level and were the most important within the diet. So this is really interesting because most diet talks or um, papers rather talk about how important flying fish are and how important like all the fish are. And it's like, well, actually this shows that this one squid species is really important. Um, so it might just be unique to here, but I think um, we need to do more genetics work on a species level and diet studies and also um, determine what these relationships really mean. So here's kind of a picture of what one lo looks like alive of the flying fish here on the right. And then uh, flying squid on the left. This is actually a neon flying squid. I did find two individuals within the diet. And then the middle is kind of what I see in the diet. So I... I the colors are still there, which is really nice. And you can relate it to species. So uh, it's really quite beautiful that the wings stay intact. What's it taste like? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I should try it, right? Yeah. No, it must taste good if the birds eat it. So then looking at sexual dimorphism for our, our colony here on Oahu, it's been done on many other colonies, but not specifically for Oahu. And so we used a sexual dimorphic index that was just recently released and found that body mass was the strongest dimorphism uh, indicator. And so here I have all the different uh, factors that are variables that we looked at. So mass, common length, which is just like different bill lengths. And then um, wing, wing cord, which is just like pretty much like your wrist to your middle finger, maybe if you want to compare it. And then, um, so what we see is that, so with this index, a large positive number is females, a large negative number is males. So all of these numbers show positives, so that they're all female-based, but the one that really drives home is that the mass of females controls for both years, um, whether or not it's male or female. And so... These guys do show differences. And if you look at our little 25 next to his beautiful female he found this year, she looks a little bigger. <laughs> so, yeah. It's nice to know that our boobies act just like all the other ones around the world. So uh, looking at uh, sexual dimorphism within the diet. So what we found was that females eat more than males, which makes sense because they're bigger birds. So if that didn't make sense, we'd probably be asking some questions. Uh, fish and squid mass is very similar to 2014, which we saw before, even just looking at the amount within the diet. But in 2015, females ate more fish, and then males ate more squid. So we do have this weird dichotomy within 2015 during the warm year. Um, and then, oh, for some reason that didn't work, but... Uh, in 2015, the males, oh, yeah, the males ate more fish and the females ate more squid. So to learn more about that, uh, what I did to pretty much make analysis, I know this is very sciencey right now, um, so bear with me, but the, I promise it's really good information. So <laughs> what I did to make analysis easier, um, and because most prey items were not found within all diets, I clumped them all together. So I have pelagic oceanic fish, squids, flying fishes, and reef associated fish. They're all pretty self explanatory. The only difference between pelagic reef and flying fishes is flying fish are flying fish. They jump out of the ocean, they um, glide, and then the pelagic oceanics are offshore, reef are inshore. 
the squids are all lumped together because most of them were of the one species. Um, and they all have similar um, living habitat. So what we see here, which might be hard to see for all you guys, but the red is the 2015 year, blue is 2014. And so you can see that the blue is kind of all across the board. Red is really with the squid flying fish. The next thing is that the males are in small little circles and females are in big circles. And you can really see that um, the females were eating more fish in 2015 and there's a really thick little circle into the, um, with the squids. So you can kind of really see that dichotomy between flying fish and squid through this visual. So another analysis that showed that there's a, a diet kind of difference between that year. And so now moving on to the next thing, foraging ecology. So now we take the diet and we incorporate it with the GPS tracks. And so basically we take a sample, figure out where the bird went, and then link it to uh, a, a track and a map so that we can be, oh, they got this and this is where they went. So this is looking at the second half of things, the tracking data. Oop. Yep, okay. So our main goals for this part of the study were to link the diet to the track. And the only way we can do this is by taking birds that provided a diet sample after we, like once we got the tag back. Um, we call these recapture diet samples because then this diet goes along with the last trip that they took on the GPS. So, and then we're also comparing to the two different years. And now we're considering sexual dimorphism because we saw that males and females acted differently in 2015 with the diet. And so we're looking at the variability between the two years. Like how does the diet vary by year? and by sex, and then do the trips show the pattern as well. And then with uh, the foraging trips and those little prey groups that I created, we expect to see dif the, same, the same differences. So just a general look at the foraging range. This is both years of data combined for everyone that provided a recapture <laughs> diet. So this made 33 trips or birds and it encompassed about 22,000 kilometers squared, which is a pretty, pretty good range. And this whole red line is essentially the box or circle uh, for their entire foraging range. The depth, so most, half of the, a little over half of the tracks were over 3,000 meters deep to like the deepest depth around Oahu, but then the other half was offshore, so. They can't say whether or not they forage offshore or inshore more often than not. And then for trip characteristics, I looked at trip duration, trip range, so how long they went, how far they went, and um, distance traveled. So for trip durations, we have short and long and multi-day. Uh, short is less than 12 hours, long is 12 to 24 hours, and then multi-day is more than 24 hours. So the one thing I want to show you here, though, is that our sample sizes for, for male, female were a little biased because we did not get as many females for each sample size as we would have liked. Unfortunately, this just comes with the territory of who provided a diet sample and a track. <laughs> so this is just um, how we decided short and long trips. There's a little bit of a double slope, so we cut it down the middle. And this is what our data looked like. So pretty good bimodal distribution. And then our little multi-day guy on the end. So, and then this is looking at trip range um, by trip duration. And so as you see, trip range went longer the longer you were out. So um, that, makes, <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> along with uh, trip distance. Uh, the longer you stayed out, the longer your trip was. So here, I'm just going to briefly go through this. I know the table looks daunting. But what I want to show you is that there were no significant differences by year, sex, or your sex interaction for trip duration, trip range, and trip uh, distance traveled. And honestly, even with not having enough females and that judging the data, it's like, how can that be? Like, clearly, you 
just looking at the data broadly, it looks like there should be. So then we ran another analysis in, uh, in ANCOVA and showed, um, showed that um, all of the trip characteristics, uh, no, actually, I think, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we ran a few more analyses just to see what could possibly be driving um, correlations and things between the different variables of tracking data and diet. So the main takeaway from this is that I want you to know that the further the trip went, the more other fishes you ate other than flying fish. And with freshness of the diet, it turned out the more fish you ate, the more digested your diet was. So that all was shown within this, which was great. Um, also within uh, another axis was that we saw the flying fish and flying squid dichotomy within the diet, which was great because that also helps kind of justify what we saw is actually what happened. So then the big problem that I found, which isn't necessarily a big problem, but uh, was Julian Day. So the exact day of sampling that we did, um, Julian Day goes from one to 365 and isn't date dependent. Um, and so it was actually different, even though it was only about two weeks apart for, between the two years. So after running that, what we saw was that 2014 had way uh, larger um, findings than 2015 for all three, three trip characteristics. So they went further, they traveled farther, and they stayed out longer. So this is interesting, and this is just kind of a visual to show for 2015, um, or 2014, sorry, for the three different variables that they were larger. Um, and then compared to 2015, where it was smaller. But this also could be due to, um, we have females here in black. It could be due to the lack of females in 2015. Um, so that's the main takeaway from that. Females in 2014 went farther than males, and then reverse in 2015, where the males went farther than the females. So this is just to show you what the maps look like by year. So we have 2014 and 2015. Uh, you can see they have a general broad range, and it um, wasn't significantly different by year. But then we, I divided up by year. So we have 2014 on top, 2015 on the bottom. And you can see females versus males on the left, or females on the, the left, males on the right, excuse me. Um, and you can see that females really kind of have a directional pattern between the two years. This one's a little bit of searching, but more direct. And then males have a more broader foraging, searching behavior, though it is a little direct sometimes. Um, and then what we can also see is that females generally don't, granted less females in the study, but generally don't take longer trips. 2014, they took a few longer trips and males take quite, quite long trips. So, so for a couple of short ones. So it's cool to see the difference. And so why, why even study seabird foraging ecology? What's the purpose? What, what really drives the message home? Well, Seabird foraging ecology helps us describe other oceanographic processes that affect food webs that we can't necessarily sample um, or are unfeasible to sample over time. And this also helps to support other economically important upper trophic level uh, marine predators such as tunas, which are important here in Hawaii. So if we understand how, let's say the red-footed booby is foraging and what they eat and where they go, and we know that they're associated with lots of subsurface predators. For example, um, most commonly seen with skipjack tunas. Then we figure out where they go, and then we can then we can better inform and make proper decisions about what to do with the fisheries and how the fisheries should act based on changes in diet. So then, one of the things I'm currently working working on is a foraging footprint using red-footed boobies. So derived from only 33 birds, we extracted environmental info, such as so far as sea surface temperature within this red line and created a baseline for the local oceanographic environment off of Oahu, mostly on the Eastern side where they forage. And so uh, later I want to incorporate red-footed booby reproductive success, fledging rates, 
diet, more diet, and also more environmental parameters such as wind speed, because wind speed actually is a determinant of how long they stay offshore or their foraging uh, uh, distance traveled, like all those factors. And so once we kind of create this index, then we can better understand how the boobies will react to envir the environment. What, what is a penguin banks? Penguin banks, that's a good question. It's a shoal off of um, Molokai. It's, yeah. it's a very shallow, yeah, and it's a very popular fishing site. Yeah. So um, looking at, yeah, no problem. Looking at historical sea surface temperature um, extracted from within the footprint, I did a 26 year time series because that's the amount of time I had for both June and July up until a certain point. So what we're looking here is 1990 to 2015. And then we're looking at June, which is the light gray boxes and July, which is the dark gray boxes. And what we can see here is an extreme and so event. So in 1997, 98, we had a huge and so event. And here we see high temperatures of sea surface temperature and then kind of the cooling year after the effect. And then we move on to our next one, 2015, which we just experienced in June was very warm. And then July was actually our warmest year recorded in the last 20, or warmest July month recorded in the last 26 years. So if that doesn't take home a message about how our oceans are warming, I don't know what does, but, it, and it's a very dry, it's the only one that has this extreme drastic change between June and July. So, and then going back to the importance of purple back, uh, flying squids. So since I had so many of one species, I was able to look at differences between years. And so we had slightly more uh, sample size of these squids in 2015. And we also, looking at squid mantle length, we also had much bigger ones in 2015. So gray is 2014, more of like the small size range of what was observed. And then in 2015, we had a lot more of this medium, bigger size range. And so this could indicate a size shift of consumed prey um, due to the warmer year. And it's not entirely clear why. It could be warmer water, so they grew faster and were more abundant. It could just be that um, that's what was selected at the time. It's really unclear, and with only two years to compare, it's <laughs> hard to make a definite answer, but it's cool that this prey shift happened. Now, if we go back all the way to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands where we started, it's the same prey shift that they saw that were more were abundant in the warmer year. So uh, quite interesting. Um, also, if this is the most dominant prey item within the diet, and possibly other trophic, upper trophic level predators for that matter. Um, why don't we really know much about it? And what we do know is there's a study off of Eastern Oahu that showed that for the purple backs, it's their spawning ground on the Eastern side of Oahu. And the spawning actually occurs a few months just before chick rearing season for the redfoots. And so it's nice because they can utilize this and know that it's going to happen um, for chick rearing season, but th that's really all we know. We don't know much about the life history of these guys. Um, there's a study in the Indian Ocean where it's a big fishery and they're a lot bigger, um, but then over there, there's no information really about their spawning rates. So there's definitely an information gap and it's it'll be important and we can use the red-footed boobies to even continue sampling these guys to learn more, especially during the off season, the non-chick rearing season. And then one of the problems I ran into trying to identify things, so GenBank is a huge database where you can dump all of your sequences and identifications into one spot, and people from around the world can use it um, to try and identify their, what their sequences are. And it's great for certain things. The squids, it was awesome. For flying fish, where they almost look identical, I guess the genetic code actually shows that as well. <laughs> so... Here, which is really hard to read, but the top three are one species of flying fish, and that sequence actually read 100% uh, match, which was great. But what I ran into quite frequently was if I had a sequence, then I would have like these guys on the bottom. There's three different species, and they're all 93% related to each other. 
And a lot of the times, so if like this guy wasn't here, it'd be probably about 97%. And 97 is your cutoff. Like you're, you're identified, you're great, you're good. 12 species of flying fish can't all be the same. <laughs> so there needs to be more of a push to properly identify uh, genomes and then uh, use maybe museums for the morphological side of identification to compare with genetics to properly upload their sequences. Um, so that's one thing I'd love to work on with the species that I found, um, but it needs to be more specific to the Central Pacific Ocean because it's, it was very hard to identify uh, Central, specific, Central Pacific species. What is Genbank? Genbank, it's a national database or international database for genetic sequences. Oh, some of these words I've never heard of. Oh, it's okay, no worries. <laughs> So pretty much what we got out of this study was that we demonstrated that red-footed boobies breeding on Oahu have sexual differences between male and female, and that um, they also respond differently to interannual ocean variability. And this is just a preliminary, I only have two years to compare, um, working on more hopefully, so uh, we can better explain this relationship. Also, we can use these guys as an indicator species. We saw that they can, uh, show changes over two years. So um, they'd definitely be a good candidate for uh, indicating environmental change in Hawaii and the Central Pacific, um, especially once we incorporate more into the footprint. And then we're, we can be able then to provide managers with baseline information um, for assessing ecological impact of oceanographic variability on seabirds and their associated um, food web members and upper trophic level predators. <laughs> So thank you for bearing with me on that. Um, I have to thank pretty much everybody who's helped me along the way. Uh, so for the Marine Corps base, you guys saw Todd. Lance Bookless is another environmental uh, officer. And then the range ordinance escort who allows us to walk where we're not supposed to walk without blowing up, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> So um, also USGS, uh, Josh Adams and his lab with Max, Jonathan, and Emily. Uh, Josh Adams is one of the ones uh, along with uh, Boehm who really took on the tracking study. So without that, it probably wouldn't have become a diet study. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that once you're tagging the, the redfoots, they, once you grab them, they pretty much just want to auto regurge. It's a defense mechanism. When forget the great frigate birds mess with them, they regurge to get rid of them. Like it's an auto response. And so instead of letting it go to waste, we turned it into our diet study. So that's how that's how that happened. Um, and then yes, David at Baum, who uh, initiated the need for tracking due to the offshore wind farms. Our field operatives, so everyone who helped us in the field with the tagging events, Lindsay Young, Eric Vanderwerf, Robbie Coley, Randy Rhodes, Gwen Laro, Dan Rapp, and Sarah Youngren. And then in the genetics lab, Brad Oltz for the use of the lab, Mark Renshaw for all of the genetic information I could ever want about trying to do DNA extractions. And then Abby Golder for being my lab buddy and trying to go through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tissue sampling. And then um, from Oikonos Ecosystem Knowledge for partial funding. Uh, a lot of funding for me personally to do all this work and then also for Michelle Hester, who's uh, been a great mentor for me and helping me uh, develop my professional side for Seabird World um, and personal help. So thanks, Michelle. And then a special shout out to my committee at the time, Josh Adams and Keith Korsmeyer. Keith uh, helped me a lot with fish identification and methods. And later I wanna take morphology of the fish and combine it with the genetic information. So we have a positive ID. So he gave me methods for that. And then of course the advisor, David Hirenbach, because if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't have been um, a project. He's the one who decided to pick up all the booby bar from the first year. <laughs> so um, thanks for that. And for hiring me to be a, a dietitian of seabirds. And it just wouldn't have been a great success without you. So thank you. And then uh, these guys are an example of the parasitic isopods that I mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everyone for listening and learning. Do you guys have any questions?
Oikonos, it's Michelle, would you like to, to answer this question? I can't ever remember what two words. It's, it's a non organization. It's a nonprofit organization doing conservation oh, ecology yeah. work here in California. I've never heard that before. Do you know the origin of the word? I've, I always forget it. Um, Oikonos is home, and Oikonos is understanding. The word means understanding your home. <laughs> Read the line. I have a question. Yes. Would you go back to the slide that you measure the squid mantle? Sure. Um, there's this one, but I think you mean this one? Yes. Okay. Um, question is why do you measure the squid? First of all, what is the squid mantle? So, squid mantle is from this part where the tissue really starts, not the head, but right down here, all the way to the tip. That's the mantle. That's the mantle. Okay, that was yes. my question. Okay. I was wondering, you were measuring something small. Oh, okay. You're measuring the length, basically. Yes, the length, no essentially, problem. without the head, yes. I got another question, though, on the, um, you can go back to the, the one that has the asymptote. Yes. That was a while ago, I said. Yeah. Yes. No, explain quickly. I kind of forgot the acetone. No worries. And then this thing, everything was less than the acetone. Yes. Explain so if if the lines would have kept going straight up, that would have meant that I never reached the plateau. So that would have mean, meant that I never hit enough species within the diet to actually fully describe the diet. So the fact that they all plateaued or started even declining slightly meant that I reached, was able to explain that I fully explained the diet. It's it's hard to, um, this was mainly just used as a justification, but these guys, as you saw with like the mola, they will pick up almost anything they find on their trip. Um, though it's mostly flying fish, flying squid, um, there were many different species of pelagic, also reef fish, like I found a yellow tang once. Um, the pelagics include small tunas, so it really, uh, the different species ranged quite a bit. Yes. Does the ability have a Hawaiian name? It does. So the sound they make, which I'll I'll make for you. Ah, 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 ah. So that sounds like ah. So that's their Hawaiian name. <laughs> Sorry, my voice is a little shot, so I couldn't make it very well. But so yeah, thank you, thank you. We have we have a tree at work that sounds just like one, and every time I'm like, oh, but yes, <laughs> yes. There's a red by the chin of the booby and the red feet. Any significance of why the color is red? Uh, it's just how their pigment is, yeah. Um, it's like with blue-footed boobies. Uh, mast boobies have like a yellowish color. So do uh, browns. Browns have a lot of pretty blue in their face too with the yellow bill. So they're all, it, they're all just species dependent on the color. So there's no significance to the red. I mean, the red's how they kind of figure out, you know, they're, it was chosen for a reason, let's put it that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I don't know specifically as to why they chose red. Yes. So as they're flying along on these long trips for twelve hours, they're actually eating as they fly? Yeah, so I really wanted to dive into that, except for the program that I wanted to use wasn't specific enough for only a few tracks. And so, but what they do is they basically are searching and foraging. So they, they're flying around, they look, and some of the tracks, I wonder if we can see it. Some of the tracks you're like, oh, so like this, this female up here in 2014, you can see that she was flying. There's a little blip. So maybe she foraged and found something right there. There's a couple of like, so like searching is like the zigzags. And then um, maybe found something over here, flew over here, maybe possibly found something more searching, and then decided to come home. So that's kind of the straight lines are like, they're just straight gung ho for their spot. So like this one down here, she flew pretty much straight down here, searched and foraged for a bit, and then headed straight back. So they kind of have that searching, foraging behavior. Okay. And then the other question is, um, 
the males go farther and the females don't seem to go as far. Is that because they're attached to the chicks and the eggs and stuff? Yeah, so that? it definitely could be. Um, yeah, and then so then we also saw that flip to for the two years. So um, in 2014, the males or yeah, the males went sh the short distance, and in 2015, it was the females. So it could just be that yeah, we caught them on their nest switch, or it could be that the environment was actually affecting them and how they were foraging. Yeah. Yes. When you mentioned flying fish, mm -hmm. are you specifically talking about the malolo? Yeah, so Malolo is the Hawaiian name for flying fish, but there's many species, not hundreds, but there's many species of flying fish uh, for the Central Pacific. Um, and then uh, there's also half beak flying fish, which have this really long uh, snout. Um, and they also, yes, they also do fly. So yeah, there's many different, different kinds of flying fish, yeah. And then... I think the had a yeah. Oh, I was yeah. wondering if there was a beak uh, color difference. There is. There is. There is. Let's see if I can get there. Oh, 25. Okay, it's in the one picture you showed. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I have a bigger picture, actually. Let me. Where are you? 25. There. So. Yeah, so the females have this pretty blue and then like a bubblegum pink color around their bill. And then the males have that like lime green. And then it's more of like a salmon colored around um, the skin, like the skin so around the No, that's, yep, yeah, that's what everybody looks like during breeding season. And then I've been watching them at least really closely for the last year, year and a half. And I almost haven't really seen that the green possibly dies down, the yellow green dies down a little bit, but they almost have it all year long. I think it just gets really vibrant during the breeding season, along with the feet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question, anyone? Any final question? <clears throat> Yes. Jackie? Um, have you looked at like how much plastic they ingest and are you gonna be looking into that? Yeah, good question. So I found zero plastic within the diet. Yeah. Um it could be <laughs> <laughs> so let's let you know, hear it out, hear it out. So it, it could be um there was a study by Dan Rapp that found uh, a few birds that did end up having plastic for the boobies. Um but uh it could be that the prey that they're eating because boobies are special and they don't have a gizzard. And so most of the plastics we do see are within the gizzard, sometimes within the proventriculus, which is a stomach. Um, so since these guys don't have a gizzard, it could be that they either just eat it and poop it out, able to poop it out, or um, that, yeah. And then like, it could be too, I'm thinking about doing this and haven't had the chance to do it yet, but I saved all of the prey items from my, the study and I'd like to open up the fish. The squids don't have anything in them, but I'd like to open up the fish and see if they have microplastics to be able to kind of confirm that maybe the, the prey that they're eating do have it, but maybe they're able to expel it. Um, but yeah, so far, at least directly, they do not um, eat plastic. <laughs>